So within this architecture that we described and developed in the last section, let's think in general terms about how genetic information could guide the receptor field definitions and the behavioral components. And we'll start with the visual areas. And genetic information here could define how the connectivity from the retina through the various visual areas is organized initially so that receptor fields of the appropriate complexity are defined. And as we discussed earlier in the course, the retinal cells detect center surround fields. And genetically defined connectivity into cortical area D1 could be established such that receptive fields correspond with boundaries between light and dark. Then the number of inputs per neuron into the higher visual areas from lower visual areas are such, can be such that as receptive fields are heuristically defined, they're effective for discriminating between the appropriate circumstances. However, in some cases, genetic specification defines fairly complex receptive fields, such as fields corresponding with caricature faces with different expressions. And the connectivity here is actually specified under genetic control. Another example is a caricature for an animal. But although these caricature receptive fields are defined genetically, they are starting points and they can, of course, be evolved by experience. So there could be a number of these caricature face receptive fields, perhaps all very slightly different, and different ones will be detected when viewing different faces and will expand over a number of experiences to become specific to different aspects of complex face perceptions. So the complex face perceptions could incorporate features that are often present during a, a range of experiences so that these feature receptive fields can become incorporated into the definition of the genetically programmed face receptive field. In the auditory areas, some neurons have genetically programmed numbers and sources of auditory sensory inputs that mean they're appropriate starting points to learn to discriminate between the phonemes of human languages. In a higher auditory area, neurons have genetically defined biases in favor of inputs from combinations of the earlier area with the number of inputs and the thresholds set at levels appropriate for discriminating between words. Effective receptive fields can again develop through experience from these starting points. And genetically defined biases on connectivity can also aid the development of receptive fields in the association cortex. Some columns in the frequent simultaneous activity area have lots of initial inputs from a randomly selected range of columns in the discriminates visual objects area. Experience will then develop receptive fields corresponding with the appropriate groups of visual objects columns. And those columns also have a genetic bias in favor of output connectivity to the discriminates words area. And genetic bias means that output connectivity targets the apical dendrites of the neurons in that area. And again, experience will result in the target neurons developing the appropriate indirect activation receptive fields. And of course, there'll be genetic bias on different neurons and columns in the discriminates simultaneous activity area, supporting indirect activations in the opposite direction. Then there will be a genetic bias on connectivity from discriminates visual objects to discriminates activity overlap area. And the genetic bias on connectivity also results in some columns having multiple inputs from each source column in a small group, and other uh, discriminates activity overlap columns having fewer inputs from each of a larger group of source columns. If there are two active populations in the visual objects area at different phases of frequency modulation, and there's lots of overlap between them, a relatively small number of separate columns in that visual objects area will be active. If all the inputs from the source area are brought into the same phase, then it's more likely that active columns in the activity overlap area will be those with 
lots of inputs from a small number of columns in the visual objects area. On the other hand, if there isn't much overlap between the two active populations in the visual objects area, not many columns are part of both populations, and a wide range of different columns will be relatively weakly active. So again, if all the inputs from the source area are brought into the same phase, it's more likely that columns in the activity overlap area with weaker inputs from a large number of columns will fire. So the bias on connectivity means that the set of columns in the discriminates activity overlap area that are activated in response to two similar populations active at the same time in the visual objects area will be different from the set activated in response to two quite different populations. The areas that discriminate between complex sensory situations will also have genetic biases on the areas from which they receive inputs and the thresholds for receptive field detections, which again will tend to result in receptive fields that can discriminate between specific types of circumstances. So finally, within this same architecture, we'll have a look at how genetic guidance can help the definition of behavioural components in the basal ganglia. In the basal ganglia, there are components corresponding with the combinations of muscle movements required to speak each of the about 150 phonemes in, used in human languages. These components are defined by genetic information. In other words, there's genetically connected connectivity from each of these components to different combinations and sequences of muscles in the mouth, the tongue and the throat. The speak phoneme sequences components have a genetically defined capability to target different combinations of the 150 speak phoneme components. But this initial connectivity is relatively random. In other words, it's not programmed to speak the combinations uh, of phonemes, the sequences of phonemes that actually correspond with the words that will later be learned. So this is the overall architecture. But there's one other process that's involved that's critical for development of the appropriate connectivity, and I will get to that process in the next section.